okay, this person that's sitting next to me, you know, I, you know, they don't, they don't believe like I do. They don't celebrate holidays the way that I do, or they don't do the things that I'm accustomed to doing. And mm-hmm. so I think that's what, you know, gets us in trouble in society is that we think that our way is the only way. And it's not like that. You know, there's just so many more aspects. There's so many more social forces that come into play. So thanks for sharing yeah, that. Yeah, of course. Welcome to the Mission Driven Podcast, the show designed to empower, educate, and encourage you to stay focused and committed to your mission. I'm your host, AC Cristales. Let's get ready to roll. Welcome back to the Mission Driven Podcast. I am back, baby. I hate that I was unable to publish a podcast last week, but strep throat took me out of commission for a couple of days. But I'm feeling better. You know, my voice is still a little raspy, but... You know, we're, we're going to make do. Um, however, you know, last week I did have the opportunity to interview my first teacher guest, and I'm excited about that. And if you're thinking, AC, you know, I'm not a teacher, so maybe I don't really need to listen to this episode. I want to encourage you to reconsider that thought, because in this episode, my guest really opened up uh, about his life, and he shared about a dark time in his life that allowed him to find his purpose. And I know that if you listen with an open mind, it's going to really, really just encourage you if you find yourself, you know, in a, in a dark spot right now, because, you know, many times we think, you know, it's only the good moments in, in life that confirm that there's a calling or that there's a purpose for us. But really, sometimes it takes being broken and hurting to finally realize the greatness, the potential that lies within us. So I hope you enjoy the interview. Here it goes. All right, thank you so much for joining me on the Mission Driven Podcast. I'm your host, AC Cristales. And for today's episode, I have a special guest, Weston Wilcox. And for me, this is a, I'm very happy to have him as my guest because he's going to be the first teacher that I interview for this podcast. In the past several weeks, I've, I've interviewed a principal, I've interviewed uh, an educator who works as a campus pastor, and I've interviewed an educator who works with you know, mentoring young males at the college level. But now I get a middle school teacher in the flesh, in the house. We're recording this the night before Thanksgiving. Weston Wilcox, welcome. Thank you for having me. Good to be here, AC. All right, man. So, um, just, uh, hey, real, real quick before we get into the questions, you got any, you have any, I know, you know, teachers love, you know, Thanksgiving breaks and Christmas breaks and spring breaks. So, you know, you got any big plans for the break? Uh, not too much. Uh, just catching up on some Z's and uh, maybe playing a few go- a few rounds of golf. I don't know. There you go. Depends on the weather. All right. Yeah, the weather's been good so far here in Dallas. Um, all right, man. So let's just go ahead and get into it. Start by giving it, giving us a bit of information, you know, about your family, your educational background. Okay. Well, uh, so I started, I grew up in Rockwall, Texas. Um, my aunt uh, eventually became the assistant superintendent in Rockwall. So I come from an educational family um, that has been in the field. Went to Texas A&M University. Honestly, when I went there, I had no idea what I wanted to do. It, I got caught up in the college was the next step. That's the next big thing that you're supposed to go do. And had no idea what I was going to do. Changed my major my sophomore year to education because I was like, I'm going to go and change the world. Mm -hmm. The kids Mm -hmm. need me. Um, And like, I can handle this, not the salary and everything. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. It's not about making money and Mm -hmm. everything like that. And I don't know. I just really, really felt like that was my calling. Okay. And, and so I I went through my whole educational career at A&M and uh, took a bunch of classes that, uh, (laughs) <laughs> when you get out in there, you're like, okay. Okay. <laughs> They're, uh, These like educational classes? Oh, yeah, like okay. on how to be a teacher. Yeah. You, you, that you, never you, really prepares you for it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's all trial by fire, all trial by fire. Yeah. And then I uh, graduated in December of 11 and got my first teaching job with you actually, you. That's you, right. You, that's you right. Hired, you I was hired me that hired for you. my first that's job. That's right. Math. That's right. Middle school math. Yes, for a teacher that left mid year, mm-hmm. and so the students were gonna be great that yeah, year. Exactly. And uh, yeah, so it it got me started off. Uh, then I went. I left your school, and went to Aiken Elementary, where I taught for two years. I taught fifth grade and fourth grade. 
um, always math. And then fourth grade, I taught a little bit of science in there, you know, non-tested subjects. So we mm-hmm. really focused hard on that. Exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, just after that year, the whole time thinking, this is not what I need to do. Just, just the way it worked. I was great with the kids, but it just, I just never felt like this is, this is what I'm supposed to do. And so it's been like that really every year until this last year. Okay. But before we get into that, let's, let's focus on, so you were at A&M, right? And you're mm-hmm. a big, you're a big Aggie fan. You're still an Aggie fan. Yes, right? of course. Diehard. Once, once so, you're in the cult, you don't yeah. really, you don't leave it. <laughs> okay. So in terms of, you know, going to school, was, was your major initially education or do, or correct me if I'm wrong. Were you in like playing sports out there, playing baseball out there? Um, I actually, I was a yell leader at Texas A&M. Okay, yell, okay. It's like a student body elected position. Everyone okay. calls it a cheerleader, so I just accept <laughs> it um, for what it is. But basically, it's like five guys that get the, basically, I'm Mickey Mouse. Like, okay. I'm, I'm a cookie cutter. Like, hey, how you doing? You yeah, know, yeah, good yeah. to see you. Welcome to Texas A&M. Yeah. Um, and just really kind of in the limelight, a big position. So I kind of peaked in college a little bit yeah, <laughs> from, okay. that re- from that perspective. And then I come out and I start teaching and... It's like a total transition from being like the most loved on campus to all of a sudden you're in a classroom where these kids are, you, you gotta, you gotta get them. They don't have no idea who you are and you gotta exactly. get them to exactly. start from scratch. They don't know what you've done. They, mm-hmm. Like all you try and tell them about what you did. They're like, you were a cheerleader. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell middle school is that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, why don't you t- tell us a little bit about that middle school? I mean, you know, people who are listening, you know, because you could go into a middle school and, and you can, you can tell somebody, Hey, you know, I went to A&M. And for them, it's a big deal because they have that connection with A&M, right? You know, maybe they had, you know, a brother, uncle, aunt, whoever, you know, someone within their family that went to A&M or knows about college. But the school where we were at, a lot of our kids, they don't, they're going to be first in their families to go to college if they right. decide to go. So why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, the students that you worked with that first go around? Oh, yeah. Like um, very underprivileged, like kids that have so much hope and drive it's just they don't have the people telling them that they have that and that they can get there um and so really I kind of it kind of transitioned from me like seamlessly having to have people like want to listen to what I have to say to to come at it from a different perspective and, and meet them where they're at yeah and so it just it changed the whole whole perspective of like what these kids actually need do they really they need this math, of course. They need to pass their exactly. test. But mm-hmm. they need so much, so much more in order for them to be successful in the classroom that comes outside the classroom or through those interactions that you have inside the classroom. Okay, very good. Very good. So you were there and then you went to an elementary school. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, going and teaching, you know, Mid coming in mid year, which is a difficult time, like you mentioned, because anytime anyone comes in mid year, there's already, you know, this this sense of inconsistency, right? Because mm-hmm. you know we had this one teacher, and now we're gonna have another teacher. So the rules that were established in August are gonna be totally different in January. But what led you to take that position? Besides, hey, I need a job. There had to be something that you know. I mean, you know, and, and we can be honest with that, and you know, yeah. me, I'm I'm real and transparent and know that. But I also remember a time when there was somebody that I interviewed and he, and, you know, and I think he was interviewing for, for a science job. And I said, what, what job do you really want, man? You know, I asked him frankly like that. I was like, what job do you really want? He's like, well, I really want to teach math. And I said, well, you know what? He said, I told him, I'm not, I'm not going to hire you for this position. And it's not because you're not good here. You know, he was spot on. Every answer he gave in his interview was great. But I said, look, the last thing you want to do is teach a subject that you're not passionate about because that will be evident to the students. And then you're going to hate it. You're going to hate it. You're going to be teaching something just because you feel you have, you know, you need a job. And so I always liked this story because he didn't take that job, but I recommended him to another middle school in Garland. He mm-hmm. got hired there as a math teacher doing what he wanted to do, right? Right. And then um, I saw him a couple of weeks later. You know, he used to, he used to be a server at, at Chili's while he was still teaching. And he was just like, thank you. He's like, you're right. He's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the spot where I need to be. So, yeah, you know, sometimes we take jobs because we need the money. Mm-hmm. But sometimes, like, there's something that, okay, I need to be in this place. So what do you feel led you to, to be at that school, to be at Sam Houston Middle School? <laughs> <laughs> Sam Houston. Um, yeah. I, the way it worked out for me is I did need a job. Mm-hmm. And 
I, I was feeling that pressure getting out of college, needing a job, but I also knew I wanted to be in education, or at least like that's what I went to college for and I wanted to try it. But why is that? I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. Why is that? Why do, why do you feel you needed to be in education? Because I'm really good at working with kids. Actually, it goes back to the ministry background that I had at AM. Okay. Okay. I Which did, he didn't mention. So I didn't good. mention that's good. that. That's good. Right. That's good. I did. I did some young life stuff okay. uh, and working with kids and uh, really just kind of sharing my passion about my beliefs and my my spirituality and stuff and help seeing these kids progress and and make life decisions in front of me that are that are good life decisions. It, it just really lit a fire for me and and I kind of wanted to transition that into the classroom, which was very different at first because I went from doing like ministry where you can openly speak about that kind of stuff exactly. to where then you're now in a classroom where you're not necessarily allowed to mm-hmm. to push your beliefs but at the same time you, you push them through the way you live your life and that's good yeah I like and that. so like that's why I, I I walk along I walk along life with these kids like yeah. these kids we live our life together that's, okay that's how that's what my classroom's like okay we're, we're like a family. For sure, for sure. And that's another thing that, that I hit on, you know, community. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what it's about. You know, when I go and I speak to, to principals and teachers, it's about we're building a community. And even in my classroom as a college professor, we're building a community. So that, that's good. So calling, right? You felt that was your calling. Yes. It, and, I, and here was the opportunity. And so, you know, maybe you're the mindset that, you know, things, everything happens for a reason, right? So you were at San Houston for a reason. You know, this aligned with your calling. And then you were there but now you're at an elementary school. So kind of walk us through that process. So I, I got the elementary school job because I needed another teaching job mm-hmm. and um, met the principal, got hired, did well there. My scores were good. It just was not the right fit for me. Um, I'm not very foo-foo. I'm not going to decorate my classroom with a huge theme. Yeah. Like that's just... That's just not my style, mm-hmm. um, and that's what they kind of wanted. So really, they it was kind of like I got pushed out, but in like it was like for the best thing possible. And at that time, when I was leaving elementary school, I was like, okay, I gave it a fair shake. I did it for two and a half, almost three full years of teaching, huh. um, and so I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna do something else. Okay. And that whole summer. I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, wasn't sure, had no idea. Mm-hmm. And um, then that's when I called you up and I was like, hey, yeah. uh, I need a teaching job. Like, exactly. <laughs> and so that's that's why, you know, because, yeah, you you, know, you love Sam Houston and I, I, you were even doing some insurance stuff, I had stuff, business right? cards to yeah, sell insurance. Yeah, you were doing some insurance and- stuff. So I was like, okay, this guy's out the game, you know, which is fine, you know, because... You know, let, let me let me go back to what you said. You know, you're not foo foo type, and and that goes back to the story that I was telling you. The worst thing you can do is to be in a position that you're not, you know, you're not fit for. It's all about fit. Exactly. So you're gonna be in a, like, I can never teach kindergarten. I love the kindergarten kids. Trust right. me, they're cute. Little angels. And I, I don't know about little angels, <laughs> <laughs> depending on what 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 school you're working at. You know, but there's no way that that I would have the patience for that. So. You know, I wouldn't want to be in a position like that because I know that that's not for me. So I guess, you know, like you said, it was, yeah, you know, you know, you weren't there anymore, though, but that was kind of what you needed to find your place to where you really wanted to go. So you're in this transition period, you know, in the summer, you're looking for a job, um, you're doing some insurance stuff. Were there, were there other things that you were debating doing? Um I almost tried to sell medical devices. I've tried to go into sales multiple times. I've sold roofs on the side. Um, I thought about going to sell cars. Basically, everything involves so, sales. So, okay, so, you know, because let's say somebody's listening to this. They're like, all right, you know, this guy, you know, taught for, you know, taught middle school for a bit and then taught elementary school, but now he's trying to leave. Is that is that right? That's, that's pretty much okay, right. Okay, so why were you trying to leave? Um, Education. The system, I thought, was kind of broken as to what they're for they were forcing me to focus on like my lesson plans and stuff like that when I'm building relationships with these kids and that's the only way to get them to to learn from you is to have a relationship with them because they're not going to listen to you and so like just the the whole idea behind it wasn't pushed towards building relationships till I got at my new school um it was more so on do you have all your ducks in a row? Is everything on paper beforehand before you actually get in the classroom for you to be successful? That's the only way you can be successful. Mm-hmm. And that is just 
not my style. Yeah, exactly. I'm extremely unorthodox when it comes to uh, your standard teacher. Um, just with the, my personality and the way that I uh, go about um, presenting the subjects to the kids yeah. and, and finding a different way to, to teach it to them, as well as uh, the conversations, interactions that I have with them, just treating them like people. Exactly. Um, but uh, yeah, I was all I've, I've always been wanting to leave teaching mm-hmm. until this last year. Like I, because the money you're like, oh, I don't have enough money. All this other stuff. If you just budget, you can make it work. Mm-hmm. Um, but just like young, like young stuff when you're in your twenties mm-hmm. and you're like, okay, I know I don't want to do this for the rest of my life, but I have no idea what I want to do. And so I know just going out and getting another job is not going to make me like satisfied. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be a different evil, Um, an evil that I don't know. And I don't know if I have anything that I enjoy about Mm -hmm. it, Mm -hmm. but I do know for a fact that I enjoy the kids and teaching like kids. And there's just that other aspect of, like you said, the system's broken. The other aspect that sometimes that you just you know, got to work around. Yeah, you got to work it around. But sometimes, you know, it seems like it seems very robotic. Like I need you to do this, right? I need you to yes. do this. And here's the beautiful thing, because you asked me this when you you know you came in here before we you know we got on the mic turned the microphones on. You asked me how do I like you know teaching at a college, and what I like about it is that they have this you know if you're in a higher education they have this term called academic freedom. So you have, as a professor, you have academic freedom. As long as you're not doing anything that's going to be harmful to the students, right. you know, and, and as long as you cover the material that's supposed to be covered per, you know, the college standards, because they're still college standards. So you're teaching sociology, and there's certain things that you have to cover in an introduction to sociology class. But the way you teach it, right, your videos, your discussions, your lectures, your activities, academic freedom. You see what awesome. I'm saying? <laughs> Which is awesome. As opposed to, hey, you know, here's this curriculum. Make sure you follow it. Here are the and activities. we want you to do these lessons. Exactly. And we want you to exactly. do them on this day. So so I can, you know, and, and, you know, luckily for me, when I was teaching, you know, I was a bilingual teacher. You know, I had a principal who was like, look, as long as the kids do well, you know, because it's all about scores, right? As long as the kids do well, you know, I don't really care what you do. Because number one, she had to trust in me that, that mm-hmm. the kids were going to do well. But number two is like, man, we're the ones in there day in, day out. So how can you tell me that I need to follow this script? How can I be scripted when you're not even in there? You know, you're sitting, yes, you're sitting, you know, in some office, you know, ten miles away, writing curriculum, and and so I feel you, man. I I can see why. And there's a and there's a and I'm glad I have you on here because I'm, there's a lot of people, man. In fact, you know, I don't know this, you know, this statistic right off the bat, but. You know, there are a number of teachers that will leave the profession within the first five years. It's 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 incredible yeah. because the turnover rate is so ridiculous because of the fact that it's not a coveted position. Uh-huh. Like people don't want to become teachers. It's it's okay. I'll go teach. Now. Exactly. And it's like a backup plan for most people. Like which makes me mad too. By the way, it's frustrating. <laughs> Absolutely, because here I am. Like I chose this. Like yeah. and I chose it for the right reasons. Because I know what I've got myself yeah. into at this point. Like yeah. I mean, I know what it is. Yeah. And like you see people coming in that are like, oh, I just I was coming to teach. Like I mean, it's 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 not looked at as a coveted position. And so. Until it is, it's good. You're going to continue to get the same kind of problems in yeah. the classroom, yeah. Because there's no respect for it. Exactly, exactly. And the kids see that. Yeah, and it goes back to what we talked about a few minutes ago. And I know I'm, I'm kind of beating on this, but um, yeah, well, I'll teach it. Well, do you really like science? No, but I need right. a job. I'll teach it. I'm like, well, why am I going to put you there? Because you know who's suffering? The kids are suffering, exactly. and you're suffering as well because you hate it, mm-hmm. and that's going to be you know evident to them. So, all right, so. I, I like this. You know, we're going on a journey. So you go to Aiken. You're there at the elementary school for a couple of years. And now the phone call to me. All right. So where do you go from there? So that phone call, where were you interviewed? And I still remember that phone call, by the way. I was with my daughter. It's funny the things that you remember. I was with my daughter. Yeah. You called me like, hey, you know, I um, let's go play golf. Yeah. And I was like, bro, I'm not good. <laughs> I'm like, you're probably going to be good. And sure enough, you're like, you're Hey, everybody listening, like, Weston is seriously the best golfer I've ever played with. But, yeah, we go and we play golf. And um, you just, you know, it was good. It was good to, you know, spend time with you because, again, like you said at the beginning, you know, I'm the one that hired you. I saw something in you, man. And and I'm not going to say that I, you know, I'm batting a thousand when I hire people because there's always right. people. <laughs> there's yeah. always people who will fool you, man, and tell you they do these things. But with you, man, I, you know, I knew that you would be the right person for that job. And so, which is the reason why I took that phone call, which is the reason why I said, yeah, let's meet up. 
And uh, and I, I was honored, bro. I was honored to to be like, all right, man. This this guy obviously feels that there's some sort of wisdom that I kind of that I can impart, you know, with him. So lead us to that to that yeah. summer. Yeah, no, and I uh, I trusted you too. And the big thing was is I was gonna be done with teaching. Gonna be done. Gonna be done. Gonna be done. And then it was August or like July, end of July. And I was like, oh, no, I need a job. I'm yeah. married. Like, yeah. I, I had, to, I ran at the time. And uh, so, like, I need to be, you know, supporting. And, like, I, I, I started interviewing with, actually, no, I didn't start interviewing. I got one phone call from Schrady Middle School from a teacher who was going to interview me. And they were like, hey, can you come in right now? And I was like, uh, I hadn't, sh- like, I, I was at the... I hadn't shaved. I was at the library, like going through all my stuff. And I was like, actually, I probably can't. And he like joked back. He was like, oh, I'm sorry. It's not going to work. I was like, ah, dang it. And so like, I joked back with him and then uh, went in for the interview. They were like, oh, no, it's cool. You can come in the next day. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I thought I lost it. Yeah. Um, but I, the fact that I joked back with them, like yeah. really, they said, set me apart. Like okay. they said they got off the phone. They were like, that's the guy. Okay. And, 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 and then when I went in for the interview, uh, we had a new principal coming in, actually, Rachel Brown. Um, who's been on this podcast. Who's been on the podcast. Shout out to Brown. <laughs> and uh, and she uh, took a chance on me. Um, she actually knew my old principal, uh, took a chance on me, and really just kind of fostered my creative teaching styles and and wanted them to flourish rather than be like okay well let's try this like no she just was like you do what you do because you're getting results and like from then on I've just I've taught eighth grade eighth grade math ever since and been leaving uh for the first few years leaving every year Uh (laughs) (laughs) um just because of the grind it is but I don't the kids keep keep me coming back and I've kind of gotten a system now that that really works with getting these kids to open up, and it's right at that moment where it's starting to get good because mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. it's it's right. I've planted those seeds, and now they're starting to open up a lot more, um, and that's when you can really start to make those connections. And okay, very good. So, do you see a change? And obviously, you know, there is a change. So, tell us the change within when you first started. You know, at Sam Houston. Now you're at Shrady. How many years have you been at Shrady? Six. Six years. Wow, already. Yes. Okay, wow. So six <laughs> years. Okay, six. Yeah, because it happened right when I left, when I left Sam Houston, yeah. right? You made that phone call. Okay, so it's been six years. In terms, because at the beginning of the podcast, you mentioned this was my calling. That was one of the things you talked mm-hmm. about, my calling. You know, I had worked with Young Life. And now, what do you, what do you see as your, as your life mission and how does that align to what you do as an eighth grade math teacher? Well, like everybody else, you know, you kind of go through trials and tribulations in your life um, where you kind of lose sight of what your calling actually is. And for a while there, I've really lost sight of it. Um, and it trans it translated into the classroom. Like I still did my job, but I wasn't completely there okay. um, or present because I struggled with something that, other people struggle with. It was something that I didn't expect to happen to me. Um, and it did. And it drained my ability to, to pour myself into, into the classroom. And, mm. and I thought it was the job, but it wasn't the job. It was the stuff I was doing selfishly on the outside that, that kept me from really being the best teacher that I could be and really impacting the kids on a whole bigger scale than I ever could have imagined. And once I, once I dealt with that and, and, and put it to death, like it, it truly, it opened my eyes to this is what I'm supposed to do in some form or fashion, working with kids to teach them, whether it be about life or whether it be about math or whether it be theater, Mm -hmm. I don't know. (laughs) Like I, 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 it, the it's just kind of open ended for me as far as where I'm going in education. It's just but you know you have to be with them. I know I have to. Okay, very good. So, and, and you mentioned that, and, and you can be as open as you want and as transparent as you want. Again, there's no pressure here. But in terms of life experiences, because again, this is something we touched on as we were, you know, <clears throat> setting up this this interview. You know, a lot of people, um, especially kids, but even a lot of people, you know, um, 
they'll they'll think teacher or and they'll think that you know we don't go through situations you know but we do you know teachers go through divorce just like anybody else you know teachers of go course. through through they suffer loss they suffer you know um the death you know of, of, of a loved one i mean all that i mean we're human man you know just because we're teachers don't mean that we don't experience pain we don't experience suffering so discuss some experience that you feel have helped you make this turnaround because what i'm seeing right what i'm seeing with with what you're talking about there's kind of this there's this redemption right there's this redemptive story so yes you know share some experiences and how you feel that has helped you to where you're at right now um so this last year was the craziest year teaching for me um i was struggling personally wasn't there fully in the classroom day to day i mean i was there but i wasn't like doing the stuff like I wasn't being my normal teaching self. Um, and I knew, I knew that and I felt that, um, scores still turned out great. Mm -hmm. Um, but I kind of approached this, that year differently. Um, I, I treated the kids a lot more like people and, and like humans cause it was a different group of kids. Like mm -hmm. they, they, they needed a lot of attention and they opened my eyes to things and, once I once I turned around and finally was like, okay, something's not right here, um, and it's not this job. It's got to be something bigger. I, I honed in on those details that I needed to change. Once I changed them, like my mind and my eyes were open to so much more that was going around in my classroom or in like my school that I didn't realize before, and having that extra like energy to ask a kid like, Hey, how you doing? Like, or the, I guess the follow through to like, you see a kid having a bad day. You, you talk to him later, you, you know, you check up on them, make sure things are going like going. Okay. Um, just a lot of things happened last year where I was put into situations that I never thought I would have been in, yeah. um, from stuff that you would never want to never want to be in. But had I not, been present and had my mind open to him, it nothing might have ever been done, and mm -hmm. and it could have hurt a lot of people. Uh, I'm speaking very, very shadowy, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but because it, right. it's 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 a big it's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it was a big deal, but yeah. um, like it there were three different incidents where you should never have to deal with as a teacher, yeah. and I dealt with them all, and yeah. if not me, then who like yeah. is going to be doing this because no one connects with these kids better than I do. Okay. Like the, it, kids connect, people connect with kids on every level. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying that I'm the best, but that is one thing that I'm an expert at okay. is, is meeting every kid where they're at and trying to find something that I can connect with them on. Um, because I'm a salesman. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like that's that's how I teach teach yeah. my classroom. Yeah. I, I, I sales. Like yeah. I get the kids to buy into me and then they'll yeah. buy into what I'm selling. Exactly. They don't trust you, they're not gonna learn from you. Not a chance. It has to be trust and where do you even in, in terms of where you go and, and spend your money at, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you're gonna go to a place that you trust. Right. You're not gonna go to some rinky dink car dealership. <laughs> right. Some hole in the wall place exactly. that you don't know anybody there. Exactly. Like it, and so like that's why I just think it's funny when Teachers are saying, I just can't, I just can't struggle. I struggle in the classroom. I don't know. Like, well, what are you, like, what are you doing to, to get to know your kids? Yeah. Like, and because if you don't know them, you can't teach them. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and not just know them like, oh, they make, they know how to write that sentence. Like, yeah. or they know how to do that math problem. It's like, know them like, oh my gosh, that kid is a boxer. He, he boxes in his spare time. Like, yeah. Oh my God, that kid, um, like writes characters and makes their own storybook mm -hmm. about a whole like comic book that they want to make and, and just stuff like that. You bring up like as little nuances in your teaching or like when you're talking around the classroom and talking with the kids, you just kind of lay those things subtly in there and then they'll work for you yeah. because they, you can they realize you care about them. You remember things. Exactly. And, and so like that's, that's been the most beneficial thing I've ever, I've ever learned about teaching is, that if you don't get to know the kids, you don't stand a chance. Exactly. That's good. That's good information right there. So moments, right? Because you, you talked about there, there's three moments. And again, I'm not trying to get you to share what those moments are. But it's all about moments, man. It's all about situations that, that we 
that we go through as, as individuals and that we're going to continue to go through, man. There's, you know, there's this process in, um, in sociology called socialization where it's a constant, like you never stop learning, right? You never stop learning. There's always something that you can learn. There's always something that you can, that you can get, you know, in terms of, you know, just experiences that you go through, you know, situations that you're placed in. And even as a teacher, you, you hit this as well. Like the group of students that you had last year, you know, were, were a different group. Well, next year is going to be a different group. You know, it's, yeah. like, it's constantly changing. So your approach constantly has to change. So knowing that, right, knowing that the moments have impacted you, you know, to a place where, you know, you feel more confident as a teacher. And one of the things you mentioned as well, you feel that you're in the right spot. I want to know why do you feel that now? Why do I feel I'm in the right spot now? Yeah. Well, um, let's just dive right in. Uh, I, there's a big stigma out there about mental health. Um, okay. Like everybody wants to be sensitive to it and um, be respectful to it and say they care about it. But when you talk about the real things that are involved with mental health, uh, you get stereotyped and you yeah. get you get put into a, a a box that you don't really necessarily ask to be in. Okay. Um, the beginning of last year, I went through about a three month period where I thought this is pointless and I never, this meaning teaching. No. Okay. This meaning life life. Okay. All right. And it, it, it affected everything of course. Cause when you, when you lose that whole focus of life being purposeful like it's a very very difficult way to live and like yeah. in your other podcast you talked about existing rather than living yeah. and it that's what I was doing and I felt that on the biggest weight on my shoulders to where like I, I wanted to, I just wanted to be done yeah I, I like I tell <laughs> it's the it's weirdest thing anytime you tell somebody you you think about killing yourself yeah, yeah. that they're like oh my gosh like we need to get this guy help immediately. Like, no, that's, it wasn't going to do anything. Yeah. Like I was just there. I, I think about, I thought about it. I never would have, I don't think I've ever would have done it. Yeah. Um, but I also can understand how dark of a place that can be. And I, I can empathize with people that have, that struggle with it now, exactly. but nobody wants to talk about it mm -hmm. because, because it's like, oh, we can't. Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to think about that. It's mm -hmm. So, or it's so selfish. You're so selfish to do that. Like, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. every everything has its good and bad about it. But there's no good that would come from that because you just end it. And I just, I got to the point where I knew I didn't want to be the. I didn't want to take myself out of the game. Mm -hmm. And it took me hitting a tree uh, in my car and almost dying to figure that out. Because. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Fell asleep at the wheel. I hit a tree. Engine block was in my passenger seat. All while I'm teaching. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm going through all that. And then it was just like, boom, wake up. Quit what you're doing. Uh, and I did. And, and I, and I kind of chose to live. And not just sit back and exist anymore. And try to invest in my kids more. And, and, and I did. And it in the last month and a half of my last year was the biggest, most impactful mm -hmm. teaching experience I ever had. Yeah. And so I've kind of carried that over into this year where I'm teaching math lab, mm -hmm. which is my favorite because mm -hmm. it's all kids that hate it. Are mm -hmm. they, are they like, are there, it's a second math class for the day. And so we got to get real creative with getting them excited about being in the classroom. Um, but, uh, yeah, my personal struggles really, I didn't realize how much were affecting my job until I decided to like commit to myself. Yeah, there we go. And I was thinking about that too. You know, you talk about investing in your kids, but you have to invest in yourself mm -hmm. too, because if you're not right for, for you, you're not going to be right for them. Exactly. And that works in any relationship or mm -hmm. in any relationship as a father. If I'm not good for myself, I can't be a good father to my daughter, right. you know, so, um, but man, you know, just, and thank you so much for, for your honesty and your transparency. Cause again, you know, you didn't, you didn't have to share that. But the, one of the things that I love about, you know, what I'm doing and what I've done, you know, um, is just, and this is something that I, that I, that I harp on, man, 
you know, we all have a story, man. You know, yeah. we, we all have a story and there's power in our story. So I guarantee you this, but I guarantee you that there's someone listening right now who's like, man, I needed to hear that. I needed to hear that, you know what, this is real. I needed to hear that there are people who feel that they've been in dark spots or maybe they're Absolutely. currently in a dark spot, but this guy came. And if anything, you know, you talk about how the, your engine block was in your passenger seat and you're still here. And you, you look you look fine, right? I would, ne- I would have never imagined <laughs> Nobody, that. Nobody would have ever, nobody but, ever but man, would have if, what that tells me, and this is just me just knowing just what I've heard, that, man, God has a purpose for your life because you're still here. I agree. And I... And I and, I'm sure you feel the same way, right? Well, yeah. I, I, <laughs> yeah. When I looked in the mirror after everything went down and I was just like, I, I couldn't help but laugh because I was like, what are you doing? Like yeah. you, you've tried it. You've thought about taking yourself out of the game. You've, yeah. you, and here, boom, you almost did. Yeah. And like, he's just not going to let you do it. But at some point, he's going to give you over to it. Yeah. So do you want to step up and make a change? Or do you want to continue this unfulfilling, monotonous, just drudge that yeah. you've been going through? Exactly. And I decided that, you know what? I don't know if I'm going to like it, but let's give it a shot. Like, with a positive attitude rather than this cynical mindset that I've had for so long. Yeah. Um, let go of the things in the past that that are keeping me from growing and make amends and move forward. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of like the transitioning part I'm yeah. in, in my life. And then, you know, man, and, that, and that's easier said than done. It's a of process. Course. Of and, course. And, and, it, it, and it takes, it takes having community, mm-hmm. you know, just like what we're trying to build with our students. Right. right. It takes having community, it takes being around the, man, if you really think about it, right, the things that we, that we want to instill in our students, right? Hey, you know, I'm here for you. Hey, you know, we're a community. Man, that's what we need as adults too. You need oh, to have yeah. somebody that that can be like, "Look, Wes, I got your back, man. Like, you all right? You all right? I'm here for you, right? You yes. need to have that." And you also have to be willing to say, "Hey, I do need help." Because how many yes. times do we tell our kids, "Hey, I'm here for you. I'm here for you," but they don't reach out for help? Exactly. And then you're like, "Okay, I can lead a horse to water, but I can't yeah, make them exactly. drink." It's got you got to have that that openness to change. And yeah. and I lo- I finally got that, and it and it came in the. <laughs> weirdest way I ever would have expected but at the same time thank God that it did okay. yeah <laughs> because yeah. I couldn't have I couldn't have done it like this anymore like it just it wasn't fulfilling um, if like anybody out there that 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 feels like you're in the, that spot I know what you're going through and you're not alone that's the scariest part about it is feeling like you're all alone and the only one feeling like that you're not everyone says that suicide is like this this thing this taboo thing that you're not allowed to talk about but it's a real thing that i'd say so many people struggle with whether it be just from like oh my gosh i stubbed my toe i want to kill myself like a joke to where you're going through it day in and day out of like what is the point of this i feel like i'd be better off dead it's a real real thought for a lot of people and i see it on my kids' faces a lot, the same look that I had. And I feel like now it gives me more purpose behind what I do because I know where they, I know where they are. Um, And the ability to impact that is greater than any amount of paycheck I could get. Um, Everything will come in full circle when, when the time's right. But I, I just, I, I'm open to doing things that are, I never thought I would have done. Um, just getting myself out there not just sitting back and waiting for stuff to come to me um trying to do stuff like i started doing mixed martial arts to get out the aggression (laughs) (laughs) um from the classroom uh and that has worked out great uh taking care of my body and myself has really helped me with my mind and, and getting it focused right but if like you said, if, if we're not taking care of ourselves, you can't take care of anybody else. Exactly. And I'm finally at the place in my 31 year old life where I'm taking care of myself. That's good. <laughs> hey, hey. And you're there. Took a little longer than some, but uh, but it, but it's hashtag all our, made it. It's all our journey, man. We all, you know, we all, you know, we all can fall into the trap where um, by a specific age, you know, I need to be married. By a specific mm-hmm. age, I have to have this amount of money. But uh, 
We all I have. Could have, I could have never told you I'd be like where I am right now. Yeah. Like 10 years ago. No, no chance. Yeah, well, man, that's, that's powerful. So you talked about it. You see your kids. You know, you can kind of see it in their faces. You know, the... The, the despair, right? The mm-hmm. hopelessness sometimes. And and not to say that every kid that you that watches no, your class. No, 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 no. But you know, right? You know they're the kids who 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 act out. And here's one thing, right? Some sometimes it's the kids who act out the most who are hurting the most. Uh-huh. Right? Okay, so you see that, right? The kid who's acting yes. out the most, which is why sometimes Those are my know, favorite. Exactly. Because <laughs> you can see like man, look, I know, I know what you're going through. And it's not just something that I read in my classroom at A and M, it's something that I've experienced. I've, I've lived. lived it exactly. So how do you how do you connect, man? Especially with middle school students, because middle school students, man, I always, I've always heard this: if you teach middle school, you can teach anything. You can teach high school, you can teach elementary. Middle it, school takes a special person. So how do you connect with middle school students? Um, honestly, it's it's not hard to do. Because I'm young, I think it helps that I'm more open to their culture and understandings of like what they like um, because I like a lot of what they like I like rap music um, even today's rap music oh yeah we mumble okay okay we, we, mumble, we, we, we mumble a little bit because I can't bit. get into that I, I'm sorry I, just, I, I can it's got some yeah. good beats to it like yeah, 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 yeah. you know but yeah. but at the same time like you can jam yeah um, so I just I just keep an open mind to them but really the number one thing is I treat them like human beings. Okay, that's good. And I treat them with respect because there is no person in this world that is going to respect you if you don't respect them. And like a lot of new teachers come in thinking this is my classroom. This is I have to put the foot the hammer down and otherwise they're never going to respect me, but respect is not always gained by putting your putting your fist down and like in my my mom told me, you know, a long time ago, you catch more flies with honey than you do vinegar. Yeah, um, not sure. that I'm trying to, you know, be everybody's friend. Yeah. Like I, I, like you can't do that. But like little There's stuff. something about kindness, man. You don't lose anything. It with that. is killer. You like don't, you don't lose anything being kind, nothing. respectful. You, you know, lose you hit, nothing. You hit, you hit respect, right? So what do I lose in being respectful? Nothing. Exactly. Except for them, if if which most of these kids have hearts. Yeah. Like, and when you when they have someone that does nothing but be nice to them, regardless of their antics, they are like, why is this person still here acting like, like he wants to talk to me or, or help me or do something for me? Maybe I'll listen to him. Yeah. And that's, that's, what I, that's what I do. And I, I get them to get that understanding early on and try and transition into it if they don't have a teacher that necessarily listen to them like that, try to get them to build that, those communication skills because I'm like, I'm your boss. Yeah. And some of y'all, I would fire right now. <laughs> but Real like, life. <laughs> real life. And they're yeah. like, you can't fire us. We don't even get paid. I'm like, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> I can't fire you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like they, I, I have those real, real conversations with them and, and just, I don't treat them like little kids. Yeah, I, that's good. I try and get them to accept their academic responsibility and, let them know that I care first and foremost about them learning in this classroom than I do about what grade they make on their test. All right, very good. Yeah, so you can't fire them, but hey, you can't call Mr. Cristales and guess what? I can fire you. You know what firing looks like? Here, you're going home for three days. I used <laughs> yeah. to remember saying that, like, yeah, you're right. I, you know, this is your job. I can't fire you, but I can send you home. So you talked about treating them with respect, treating them like human beings and caring about them. Is there anything else you do to connect with them? Um, I ask them questions and I listen to them. Like, generally, when people feel like they're heard, they have the more openness to listen to you. And I first and foremost ask them what's going on with them. I don't, I don't try and tell them everything they need to do first. Like I'm like, hey, how's it going? You know, what's going on? How you doing? You doing good today? Yeah. Um, and try and get that level before. I'm like, here, do this right now. Like, exactly. Then in the, they get in the routine where they, they understand that. But building those relationships before you can like, really get assignments done in the classroom is key. Yeah. Uh, and those relationships are built just by respect and, and, and just treating people with like, like people. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, how you, and how you would want to be treated. Yes. That's the whole goal in the world, right? And of course you're going to have some kid <laughs> Like smash a ketchup packet from lunch in your classroom. You yeah. can either get mad about it 
or you can have them clean it up and 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 like be like, hey, don't don't do that again, bro. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, but at the same time, like some people just blow up on it, and then it. I've written up zero people this year, and it's not because I'm afraid to write someone up yeah. or anything like that. But when I write someone up, I feel like I lose. Yeah. <laughs> like I've lost. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna lose with that kid because at the end of the day, they always have to go back. Like he couldn't handle me. He had to write something down about my behavior, yeah. and and I'm like, we can work out everything in house if it's not like illegal or dangerous like we could yeah. like we can we can have a conversation communicate and fix it rather than let it sit and it be some chip on our shoulder or something like that because we can't learn that way if you have something that's a barrier keeping you from listening to me it, we got to fix that and i've had conversations where i pulled kids aside and when they weren't and they started acting differently i'm like look we got to fix this what's going on you know me you know i'm chill you just like what, like we got to fix it mm -hmm. <laughs> or it's not going to work. That's and good. I don't want you to be miserable the rest of this year. And I don't want to be miserable either. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Communication is key. It's, a, it's I think, the number one thing in any relationship. It is. And very good. In any relationship. And that's good. And then sometimes it's, it's the little changes. It's coming back from Thanksgiving break. Hey, how was your break? As opposed to, hey, we have, you know. Oh, we have these smart. objectives to cover. Yeah, we, we, gotta, will, we, we, will. <laughs> <laughs> we will do this right now. Like let's Swabat. Exactly. How you know, how was your Thanksgiving? What you guys do? And and again, you're gonna have students who are gonna be receptive because and man, I could go on all day with this in terms of the way that they've been raised, right? The social forces in their life. And then you'll have students who are like, yeah, they'll you know, open up to you quickly, and then you'll have the ones who won't. But that's not a reflection on you. No. It's you know what they've you know, they have all these social networks that have impacted them and influenced them. So for some, they stay quiet, and for some, you know, they're willing to, you know, share. But again, as long as you provide that opportunity for them, exactly. Hey, you know, you're doing your job, man. I've got a couple of kids right now. They're just they're just quiet. Yeah. Like I, but I I say hello to them every day. Yeah. Um, I ask them how they're doing. I ask them if they need help. Yeah. Like, or if they're understanding what we're talking about. And then I ask them like, Hey, what are you drawing there? Yeah. Or like, Hey, like what was that? And like yeah. that's one of the persons or one of the kids who's like making their own comic book. Yeah. Now they come show me their drawings all the time. Yeah. So it's it's just... You showed you cared. Exactly. There you go. And right. it's, it's, it's something that goes a lot further than anybody would ever think about is just being nice to someone. I, interacting with people at the at the gas station, whatever. Yeah, like, exactly. Quit having a blocked off face. Yeah. Every every communication, interaction you have with someone is an opportunity to change someone's life for I the like better. That. That's good. I like that. Say that again. That's good. Every interaction you have with someone is an opportunity to change your life for the better. It can be a positive influence or it could be something that's negative. And, and not everybody's comfortable with themselves to be able to handle those types of negative interactions. And so like those beat down on people a lot if they're like dealing with negativity all day and they're negative within their own mind and not stable because uh, it did to me for a long time. And take things personal, all this other stuff. And so you don't know what everybody's dealing with. And so I try to be really sensitive to that um, and just put a smile on and, yeah. and just really let people know, hey, I, I do care about you. How, like, how's your day? How you doing? You know, I okay, well, hope you have a great day. Exactly. You know? And just those little subtle things that work wonders for me. Like every single day the kids leave the classroom, I say, I hope you all have a great day or hope you all have a good evening. I'll see you tomorrow. That's um, good. The little things, right? Yeah, okay. even if it's been a bad day, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just to let them know that like I'm still committed to them and I will come back and we can fix it tomorrow. We'll try again, um, giving them second chances and third and fourth and fifth. Yeah, but uh, just never giving up on them. And I finally know I can do that because I didn't give up on myself. Exactly. There you go. I like that. I like how you connected to to your personal story. So. What's what's been the uh, what's been one of the proudest moments you've had so far this school year, man? Um, the proudest moments I've had so far this school year. Um, I've got uh, nothing but lab kids, so it's all kids that failed the star test the year before. And the star um, is the standardized test for those of you who are listening outside of, of Texas. Yes, let me just give you some brief background information. The star is our standardized test that our students take state of texas assessment of academic readiness <laughs> if you will um and i i don't know what i i don't know what i do 
I don't know how I do it in any different way, but the kids all say, oh my gosh, you teach it so much differently. Like, and I'm like, well, yeah, cause I'm weird. <laughs> and, and like, just, I got rated as a B teacher, um, because my averages were above the district for this first round of testing and stuff. And, and then just a little bit below on this next one, which is like the biggest bulk of the material and just, to be that close on level with the district, with the kids that I'm working with, uh, really makes me feel good about what I'm doing right now. Okay. Um, it makes me want to work harder. So they're kind of like, I guess, scoring us on a level now, which could be bad for some people, but I'm a competitive person. So yeah, okay. it makes me want to like drive further and, and, and do more. But, uh, Another proud moment is I am staying true to myself and my teaching style in my classroom. That's good. That's the best thing you can do, <laughs> And man. I'm not paying attention to the uh, little things. I'm helping out wherever I can. I'm volunteering for morning duties and yeah. whatnot and just really just trying to be someone that's there uh, wherever they need me to be. Okay. Like Because I know wherever they need me is probably somewhere where there's going to be kids and I have more face time and an, and an ability to impact not just eighth graders, but seventh graders and sixth graders because all these kids got siblings. And, yeah. and so they tell their kid, their, their, their brother or sister, like, well, you want Mr. Wilcox? And I got like kids in seventh grade like, oh, my God, I'm going to fail my star test just so I can be in your class. And I'm like, no. no. <laughs> like, no, I might not be teaching an extra. You don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just it's, it's, it's really cool to um, see how – it was hard at first because like they don't know how to respond to a teacher being just extremely nice. <laughs> yeah. And I have my, I have my days, don't care, but I'm, I'm honest with them and I'll apologize if, if I blow up over something like that's ridiculous. I, I'll, I, I teach my, I want my kids to own their mistakes. And that's some of the biggest things like own your stuff. Yeah. Like you own it. I don't care what it is, but take responsibility for it. You say you're sorry, we fix it, we work through it. It's good. So if they if I'm gonna expect them to own their stuff you gotta own yours. and try to act like I'm not human, like I gotta own my stuff exactly. too. And, and so like I'll 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 be honest with them. Like I'll I'll apologize to students, which teachers are like, oh my gosh, you apologize? You don't need to apologize yeah. to them. Which I don't need to apologize to them. I don't have to. Yeah. Like I am the teacher. But at the same time, if you're trying to get them to think of you as someone human that they can talk to and learn from, you got to show them you're human. And, and so like I use those opportunities when I make mistakes as really big stepping stones to build relationships yeah. with my kids. Cause I'm not afraid to own my stuff, obviously, <laughs> but you, yeah. And you have to, I mean, how can you ask somebody to do something that you yourself want to do at first? Exactly. You know, and, and, and that, and that's something that that's real again for all relationships, you know, but it's, you know, as a teacher, educator, yeah, definitely. So how can I say, hey, I want you to respect me, but in the tone that I'm speaking to you is very yeah. disrespectful. I'm, I already shut off just from you saying that. Exactly. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's what, oh, you want me to respect you? Oh, okay. Yeah. And make your life miserable for the next yeah. nine months. Yeah. We're okay. going to have a misery, baby. Yeah. Very good, man. So let's get to this last question. What is something that you, so again... You know, you're, you're committed, you know, you got your focus, you know, you got your focus back, you're loving what you're doing, you feel like you, you're, you're, you're living in your purpose, you're living in your mission. So what is one thing that you would never want to do as a teacher and why? One thing I would what? You would never want to do as a teacher and why? One thing I never want to do as a teacher is focus on what the district thinks is important versus what's actually important in the classroom and lose that focus. Okay. That is one thing I never want to lose for myself is the fact that I feel like a lot of times the pressure that the district has to get scores, like I understand it, it, it all comes from a different place. Like I'm not mad at the school district. Yeah. Like I just feel like there's a lot of pressure they put on teachers um, to be a certain way and at a certain standard based on the, the ways in which they believe you can get to those standards. Um, and so they, they have this pathway that they want you to follow. And 
so my like I never as an educator want to lose my pathway in my like teaching style um, with the way that I do things. Of course, everything needs to change and everything like can constantly change for the better. But that sole focus of building relationships first and then the learning comes, that's got like that's that's my philosophy. Okay. And that's how I never want to get away from that. Very good. That's good because it's what it's all about. That's what we're doing it for, right? We're doing it for them. Right. And if we're doing it for them, we got to keep them first. Exactly. And life boils down to how well you can handle the pressure. And a lot of these kids feel that pressure on a daily basis because of society and what they're expected to become or expected to do. And so I tell them all the time, like, look, yeah, it is tough, but life boils down to how well you can handle this pressure. And let's step up and let's see what we can do, you know? Very good. All right, man. Well, hey, we've come to the end. I'm, I made it, and you talk about being competitive. I am too, man, because I, I, I went to the doctor earlier today, and they, yeah. gave, you know, I have a, you know, bacterial infection. Gave me some antibiotics. That's you know, gave up. me some. Pre- <laughs> that, that's, that is not what's <laughs> up. But, but I feel like, man, I got I got to go through with this, man, because I'm like Jordan, right? Go, playing through that with the flu game. You know, yes. for those young bucks who don't know. Michael Jordan played through the flu, but yeah, man, I'm, I'm glad though. I'm glad, you know, we sat down. I am too. I'm glad we got to do this. Yeah, man, I'm glad you, you were able to share your story, man. So. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity. Oh, um, thank and you. I hope, uh, <laughs> hope it's taken with a grain of salt out there. <laughs> no, it's, it's going to impact. It's going to impact, man. That's the thing. You got to believe that. I truly believe that when you when you truly speak from your heart, there's so many out there that's going to be impacted, man. So anything you want to plug before we leave, before we get out? Uh, no, I just, uh, thanks for having me again, man. Uh, I look forward to keep on listening. If you're not listening yet, keep listening because it's good. It's good stuff. All um, right. Thank you. Did you hear that? Keep listening. <laughs> now, nah, Wes, appreciate you so much, brother. I hope you have a great Thanksgiving. And for those of you, if you, well, this won't be out till, till Monday, so it'll be out Monday. But Monday. after, I hope you guys had a great Thanksgiving by the time you listen to this. And Wes, yeah, man, I hope you have a great. There, hope man. you have a great. I hope you have a great Thanksgiving, man. And we'll have to do it again. I appreciate that. No yes, problem. sir. Thank you. That's a wrap for episode 13 of the Mission Driven Podcast. I hope you were able to take something valuable from the conversation between Weston and me. I also hope that my sick voice and cough and sniffles last week were not too much of a distraction for you either. Look, I'm really thankful for those of you who are listening. Really, really, really thankful and appreciative of that. Um, I want to do something. If this podcast is inspiring you and motivating you, I want you to, okay, if you haven't done so yet, I want you to rate the podcast five stars, all right? We take five stars on Apple Podcasts, and I want you to leave a detailed review. And the first five people who do those two things, again, you rate the podcast five stars, you leave a detailed review as to how this podcast is impacting your life. If you do that and you take a screenshot of that review, and you send it to ac at acspeaks.com, the first five people will receive a copy of the book my brother and I authored called The School of Hard Knocks. Again, all you have to do is rate the podcast, review the podcast, take a screenshot of your review, and email it to me at ac at acspeaks.com. The first five people who do that will receive a copy of my book. But for everybody else, I want you to continue to share the podcast with your family and friends. Again, I'm truly, truly appreciative of your support. As always, the mission is now, so remain mission-driven. Until next time, faith, hope, love.